Concrete pavements aren't very kind to bare feet. We all need shoes. For most of us, what we wear is a matter of simple choice. It depends on our taste and our pocket. But not everybody is so lucky. So in these days of mass production, it's just as well we still have shoemakers. As you can see, it's from one problem to another. People come to me, sometimes the feet is all right. They're sent by doctors with back trouble. And I've got to make footwear to suit that. In a lot of cases, they're falling back, trying to pitch them forward to suit the back. There's people coming in with half feet, artificial legs, you name it, we've got them all. For instance, there's a few here. I'll explain a little about them. This lady here has an overgiant here and she has very large toes. And she walks with, with trouble underneath here. So we put a met metatosical bar here and bring up the arch and complete it like that to take the pressure off of the toes. This foot is normal. This foot here is short and also the leg is short so that we bring it up with a rock and sole as the person walks. They have no, not much life in the front of the foot, so it enables them to, to rock off of it instead of trying to bend the foot. You can guess what that is. This girl, unfortunately, her leg is very, very short. This is normal, so that's, that's a pair. I all my life at it, and I'll never know it all. Nace, or in Gaelic, Nas Nari, Nace of the Kings. A thriving market town 20 miles from Dublin, with a long tradition that reaches back to Norman times. George Tutty set up his own shoemaking business here in 1946 to serve those whose needs can't be met by the mass-produced standard shoe. George learned his craft in Dublin and County Clare 53 years ago and has been making shoes by hand ever since. Feet don't come in standard sizes. Your right foot is seldom exactly the same size as your left and really comfortable shoes take that into account. To many people, handmade shoes are a luxury but for some, Walking properly without specially designed and crafted footwear is impossible. I would like a pair of shoes of the same kind. Yes. The same leather, Mr. Tutty. Yes. If uh, you can do that, and I would like it in brown rather than black. Good enough. You'd like it exactly the same. Exactly the same. Same everything. That seems to be a very old shoe. That is Good a very made shoe. It's a very old shoe. I imagine that shoe is 20 years old. Is that so? Now, just put a foot on each page there. That's grand. Fine, I'll just, I'll just turn this up a little bit so as we can, I can see what I'm doing. Okay, fine. Just keep it like that a click now and I'll, I'll do the rest. I have a rather high arch. That's right, you have three quarters. That's nine inches. Did you ever ride any horses in your day? You I've see? ridden a few, but not... Because the foot has the sign of it. <laughs> now we'll have this little one. All right, we'll do the left then, eh? Yep. Still a high instep. Uh, he's got an extra high instep. It's running at the rate of nine three quarter. Okay. He needs sunken heels here to take the pressure off of the heels. Also, he needs a lass which is straight on the inside. It's Oxford style, full brogue. And well, that's it.
Nice leather. It's a fine leather. Yeah. It's a soft, yeah. soft, a nice color on the inside. That's Swedish. Oh. Calf. Swedish. So I think it should make a lovely shoe. Yes. That be okay? That's fine. George Tutty prides himself on the fact that he only has to take your measurements once and you can then order shoes by post from anywhere in the globe. Once the measurements are in his book, he makes up a last for each foot. These lasts will be in fact replicas of the foot, so it's important that the measurements are absolutely accurate. It's a slow, careful and painstaking business and like all craft work, it requires not only skill but a great deal of patience. In many ways, this is the most crucial part of his craft. If the last is not absolutely perfect, the shoe that will be created around it will never be satisfactory. He uses leather to adjust the shape on the wooden last. The leather will be glued to the wood, but not before George is happy that it is exactly the right shape. George Tutty's interest in making special shoes for people with problem feet goes back a long time and was born of painful personal experience. As a young apprentice shoemaker in County Clare, he damaged the arches of both feet playing football. Fallen arches are a problem, but George's boss at that time came up with the solution. A special pair of boots with special wedge heels which he designed and George made. He had to wear them for three months, even in bed, with canvas covers to keep the sheets clean. But that cured the problem, and he's had no trouble ever since. So it's hardly surprising then that George believes firmly in the therapy of a good shoe. His surgical work, as he calls it, takes top priority and gives him immense personal satisfaction. New materials have given him even greater scope in building these special shoes. Indeed, there were no steel shanks when he was an apprentice, no fiberglass for moulds, no foam rubber for comfort. But the craft is the important thing. With his skill and experience, he can be creative with almost any material. Now, this is where skill and experience really count. George draws on cardboard a pattern for the shoe. Drawing in two dimensions what will become a three-dimensional shoe is an art in itself. He must make allowances for the leather being curved, stretched and trimmed. Even among shoemakers, this is a specialized business and George Tutty is one of the very few left who can do it. George's brother Joe is a clicker. He cuts the leather uppers. The name comes from the knife he uses. It's called a clicking knife. The leather chosen for this pair of shoes is Swedish calf. Leather should always be cut along the grain, almost like wood. It means a lot more waste than a commercial shoe factory would permit but it also means a close-fitting shoe that won't lose its shape. Joe marks on the leather the spots where decorative holes will be punched. He cuts all of the leather for the uppers, the vamp, eyelets, toe cap and quarters. It needs a steady hand and a sharp knife, this work. The linings which go on the inside of the uppers next to the foot are cut from very fine calf leather. Again, the emphasis is on comfort. All the edges of the leather which will come in contact with the sole are skived, pared down so that they can be tucked under and stitched. This is the next pair we have to do then. Right. Joe passes on the pieces to Nellie Byrne. After 35 years in the business, there's not much about stitching that Nellie doesn't know. But before the leather gets anywhere near a needle, the decorative holes have to be punched out. Yeah. 
She then glues the vamps together. The shoe is beginning to take shape. Nowhere near recognizable yet, but a shape nonetheless. Years ago, all the stitching was done by hand. And while this isn't exactly a factory, there are elements of the production line in use. But the important thing is that all the machinery is under the control of its operators. This is not the world of computers and microprocessors. The interesting thing about this operation is that uppers are being made here. Even when shoemakers were much more plentiful and business was thriving, very, very few of them made the shoe from start to finish. Only eight people work here, but they produce anything up to 40 pairs of highly specialized handcrafted shoes every week. At one time, there were 21 people employed, but that was at a time when people appreciated quality and were prepared to pay for comfort. Cheap foreign imports and the consumer society philosophy are largely to blame. Fashion and the people who dictate it are responsible too, because changes in fashion mean built-in obsolescence, and that means cheap, often badly made footwear with an expensive price tag, and all because it carries a label saying fashion. Fashion changes don't make any difference here, though, because George Tutty and his workers make shoes that will last, and some styles never go out of favour. George's son, Edward, has been in this business for the past 20 years. Once the uppers are completed, he begins to cut out the leather that will make up the soles and heels. It's not easy to attract young people into this trade. There's more money in other things. But very few jobs can offer the same kind of satisfaction. Obviously, Edward and his father are pleased when a customer finds the shoes comfortable, but it's in the firm's surgical work that the real satisfaction comes. Many of the clients are referred by doctors and the range of problems presented to the family covers a multitude of ailments. Fallen arches, bunions, corns, people with one leg shorter than the other, people with one foot bigger than the other, feet that are deformed. Each is a special problem which requires an individual design. The Tutty family makes shoes to help people walk better. That's really what their business is about. There can be few things as satisfying as a customer telling you that he doesn't need a walking stick or a crutch anymore because the shoes supply all the support he needs. Once the basic work has been done on the uppers, the building of the shoe can start. The last really comes into use here and from now on all the building of the shoe is done round it. Edward checks the upper for any imperfections and fits it to the last. The bottom part of a shoe is made from the inside out, so the first thing to do is to get the insole in place. First, though, he manipulates it to make it very flexible and easy to work with. Next, the insole is tacked firmly into place on the last. A stiffener made of shoulder leather is fitted into the heel of the shoe.
The shoe is laced up now to keep it in shape on the last. French chalk is liberally sprinkled into the upper to make sure it doesn't stick to the last. Many different layers make up the toe cap of the shoe. It's quite extraordinary how many different types of leather are used in making a single pair of shoes. Stretch, clamp, stretch, tack. Stretch, clamp, stretch, tack. That's how tools and quarters are shaped. The toe puff is fitted next. This goes between the soft lining on the inside and the toe cap itself. It's made of belly leather and it too has to be stretched into position with care. The pliers he is using here is called a dog. The little tacks are called tingles. The leather is being divided so that it will curve under the toe and fit evenly onto the insole. It's not hard to see why commercial shoe factories no longer do this sort of thing. The time it takes makes it uneconomic. When early man first stubbed his toe against a rock, the shoe was invented. And now the types are legion, each designed for a special purpose. The pamputis of the Aran Islands, made from untanned cowhide, sure-footed on the rocks. The sealskin boot, that saves the Eskimo from frostbite. The wooden clog of the French and Dutch farmers, so easy to slip in and out of. The ballet pumps, the Turkish slipper, the Roman sandal, the Philippine chinella, the knee-high boot of the horseman. The critical eye of the craftsman examines his work. No, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, this is a pair of full broad Oxford shoes. Uh, there's your sample, the very same sample. Tidy leather belts, medium weight leather, and uh, an inch and a quarter heel, the yeah. leather heel. Frederick O'Neill is a Cockney, and years working in this country haven't disguised his accent. You won't find steel shanks in many shoes nowadays, which is a pity because they give really positive support to the arch of the foot. They're like the suspension system in a car, absorbing bumps. This piece of leather is called a slip welt and helps to give the center of the shoe body. The welt is fitted next. It's made of either shoulder or belly leather. It's an undersole to which the sole proper will be sewn. If you were to take the shoes home at this stage, you'd have a really comfortable pair of slippers, but they wouldn't last too long out on the street. Next, they go to the beaking machine, which firmly sews the welt to the insole. Leather is often dampened to make it more pliable. This machine not only shapes the soles, but removes any excess water from the sole leather. The sole has to be hand-stitched to the welt, and Fred cuts a channel in the sole to protect and hide the stitching. He marks out the spacing for the stitches with a roller for punching through with an awl. This method of holding the shoe steady for stitching has been used since the 17th century and is probably much older. Mm -hmm. 
Both hands work simultaneously with the waxed thread and pig bristles are used as needles. Using pig bristles means that the holes in the leather can be made quite small and the wax thread lodges firmly in the hide. If this looks easy, try thinking of it as threading needles with both hands at the same time. Next, Fred glues down the channel. The stitching is completely invisible. The heel of the shoe is built up in sections called split lifts, which help to level the center of the heel. The quarter rubber goes on next. Fred trims the final piece and marries it to the quarter rubber. It's all done with great attention to detail. Firmly nailed in place, there's no chance of this heel falling off. Tom Connolly does the final decorative work. This is purely for appearances and is called dividing the sole. A small sharp divider does the job nicely. Another case of the clear eye and the steady hand. close examination before the shoes are passed on to the next worker. Young Johnny Murray scours the soles before inking them. A little cobbler's wax on the wheel and the shoe is ready for its final polishing. A craftsman's pride in his work. Every pair of shoes made here gets the same amount of care. Some things have changed since the days when the cobbler sat on a tabletop by the window in a small country cottage, his last on his knee, creating footwear. But the tradition lives on, the skill, the craft, the pride. If it dies, we will be the poorer for it. George Tutty has now retired from the business of shoemaking and to ensure that it will continue has handed it over to his two sons, Edward and George. <laughs>